uh, hang out on uh, content strategy. Uh, hopefully, uh, Jim and Miranda and a few of the other people here are going to uh, provide some tips on how you can uh, improve your content strategy. Uh, having one would be a start. And uh, I, I've seen a few cases where that was not true and uh, it did not work out very well. So uh, how about uh, start with uh, Jim? He can introduce himself, tell us a bit about him and, uh, you know, why he's here. Hey, I'm Jim Hedger. I'm uh, one of the partners at Digital Always Media. I've been uh, an SEO for longer than I can remember. Um, and I've always focused on content as my my most potent tool in my SEO tool chest. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, when you asked me to be part of this Hangout, Terry, I'd actually intended to talk about something different that I'm going to talk about today. But two days ago, Facebook had to pull advertising from a dating website. Um, I'm not going to mention the name of the site. They don't need publicity. But they got pulled because they... They got pulled because they used content really badly. They used images of a seventeen of a dead seventeen year old girl um, asking you know people if they want to meet Canadian women online. Um, the images wow. were so offensive that Facebook pulled their ads and they're never allowed to uh, advertise on Facebook again. So I was going to talk about you know giving your client what they what they need rather than exactly what they want. But I prefer talking about using the services of like professional content creation companies and not going with the amateurs, the fly-by-nights, the ones who end up putting up uh, either copyrighted or absolutely well, you, you inappropriate could images. Say, Jim, you, you could also say, Jim, that, that proper content development teams, you know, what you guys do and Doc and Gabs and, you know... It is in the world of Panda akin to you know a crappy one is akin to a bad link builder in Penguin, no? Absolutely. I mean, a, a bad content developer is your Panda bait, whereas a bad link develop builder is your your Penguin bait. Um, I'm inclined to agree. Uh, we've been creating web content for years. There's, I mean, I'm not I'm not suggesting it's formulaic. It's not formulaic at all. But there's things you do and things you don't do. Um, there's there's so much you write, so and you know sometimes less is more. A lot of uh, content companies who are you know, just getting into the game, just writing content for the sake of writing content, or you know just expanding their own services into an area that they don't actually have competence in. Right, uh, and, and, and that's again that's clients. going back to link builder analogy. That's that just throw some links at it, just throw some content, you know over to Odesk or wherever the hell you're going and, and slaps and get some content up for the sake of content. And I, you know, I've talked to a couple of dojo members lately that are in the content development world and she she's talking to me privately on Skype. She's like, well, they just want me to like blah and spit stuff out and this and that. And there is no strategy whatsoever. It's that content for the sake of content attitude and that's a bad one to have. No, but then just, just, to, just to note, I've got my outrage out. I'm, my rant is over. Let's talk about building a smart content strategy. Okay, so Dave's introduced himself. Now he's working as a guest host today. Uh, Steve's busy building, a, getting a roof over his head, lest he be joining me in the box behind the gas station. Uh, Miranda, introduce yourself and tell us a bit about you. Okay, I'm Miranda Miller. I'm a freelance writer. I've been creating content for the web for about 10 years now. So I've done a bit of journalism, a lot of business writing, a bit of work in education. So I have a pretty well-rounded content background. Yeah, best known for writing for Search Engine Watch, I guess, eh? Yep. There you go. I wrote some good stuff there. I've read a few, more than a few. So, uh... I'll just get out my notes here and we'll start by saying uh, I think everyone does content uh, audits. Uh, what do you think the role of uh, the content audit should play in determining your overall uh, strategy for the content? Uh, what role should that play? Let's start with, uh, well, I'll start with Miranda and then go to uh, Jim and Dave. And, uh, lastly, Wiz, because he has something. Uh, good insights into uh, the buying cycle. And yeah, so I, 
I think that um, a content audit is the necessary first step, and a lot of people still aren't doing it. Um, that's where you see this sort of like library disease where things are just added and added, and no one in the organization <laughs> has any idea how much content is out there. Um, it's not optimized for people to be able to find it. You should have everything interlinked. There should be a purpose to it. So a content audit is really um, finding all those different pieces of content, whether they're on the site itself or whether they're publishing in other places, and just to get a good overall view of what they're already doing so you know where to start. Okay, to, to add to what Miranda said, uh, we're marketers. And uh, to steal from Seth Godin, um, all marketers are storytellers. Uh, he, he said, actually, all marketers are liars. But I'm going to say that we're, uh, all marketers are storytellers. So when doing a content audit, the, one of the things that we're looking for is, is our client telling their story? Are they telling the story the, um, the way they, that they would want it told? And are they telling it in a way that's going to benefit sales? Um, there's not a lot much, actually there's not a lot more to add to to what Miranda said except um, are we focusing on what the client really needs um, and are, there, are we telling their story for them? Yeah I would add that it's not just the client uh, possibly as a marketer I'm more interested in the users needs sometimes Certainly. the uh, owners needs aren't much beyond selling more product. Well that's why I always you know I always tell people rather early on is to you know, because 99 point whatever percent of the time they're not. But if you're not, start start getting your your customer service department and, and whoever's handling inquiries to start writing down the common questions that they're getting all the time. You know what I mean? Because that that's not only a great source of content if it's videos or articles or whatever you're doing around that topic, but it, it's it's saving that time. You know what I mean? Like you're saying, Terry, it saves that. It's answering a question. It's answering a need. It's not content for the sake of content. I mean, I was talking to someone last night. I, I think to a degree a lot of people would rather that. They don't want to, they feel kind of intimidated if they have to phone in the phone number to ask a question or this and that. If you can provide a lot of those answers on the website through content, you know what I mean? It helps that, you know, conversion rate. It helps that, that usability as well. You know, And it's a source of content, you know. What what questions are the, the people in the support team getting? What pe questions are the people in the sales team getting over and over that can be used as content, you know. Yeah, and that's actually where I'm going to go next is I think a lot of people, because they don't do the content uh, audit, uh, they miss where they could possibly, uh, they miss opportunities because they haven't looked at the whole buying cycle and what content is needed at each stage of the cycle. And Dave touched on that a bit. You can get some of that from the sales staff who know what kind of questions the customer is asking them. Now, uh, uh, recently, uh, the whiz there, or the wizard as we call him in the room, uh, he uh, was going over using, uh, using content in the uh, buying process to provide information on certain steps along that. And, uh, maybe you want to talk about that a bit, Wiz, and how you use yeah. that in your uh, content audit strategy. Absolutely. Well, the thing is, after after you do your personas and you know, the surveys to build your personas, the second step that we do over here is we try to have like a lead nurturing program, and this is where we match the content assets, the content, uh, 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 the, what do they call that, the, the buy cycle to the, I mean, mapping these content to the buying cycles from unawareness to retention. In the blog post that I mentioned, that I wrote uh, on Monday, I think, yeah, uh, I mentioned four stages where actually the buying cycle is actually three stages, but I added the retention at the end because it is important to to you know, based on customer service, the email marketing campaign that keeps build that relationship with the customer, uh, I I add a couple of tips in it. But usually the buying cycle starts with an awareness to the purchase of that specific product, and uh, in each section I try to mention as much as I can what type of content that you can include uh, for each uh, buying cycle, each of the cycle and the call to action that you need to use in the content. 
Yeah, that's why I thought that article was pretty good in yeah. that it was giving that kind of information. I know that's one of the things that I really look at because I'm interested in using video. So I'm looking where can video best uh, work in in that uh, you know in, in the strategy and where you know. Did you find out uh, which certain, time? Pardon me. Did you find out in which stage? Yeah. Well, it's, it uh, usually video content can 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 work any anywhere from the first two phases, which is the unawareness or awareness, and in the what they call it the evaluation part, which basically you can have like demos or try to compare certain product your product to the other products. You can use it with a video, and the unawareness is basically you know the reach. You can reach people with videos also. So yeah, whatever asset I mean. you can use. Yeah. So, uh, one of the, uh, uh, oh boy, slow day. <laughs> so that would go into how you're choosing your content. And I think that's uh, a really important part of the, uh, uh, the content strategy because a lot of these things are worked in conjunction. Uh, for instance, I like to match video, press releases, blogger outreach, and, you know, all those in one campaign. Not just one campaign that's only using one type of content. I want to have a campaign that I can uh, use as many of those as possible. Uh, any thoughts on that? And That's because you can repurpose content, too. Right. Steve knows. That's my middle name. I'm always looking for those other uses. For well, I'll just content. jump in there for a second. I think when you're trying to sell the idea of doing a content audit, it can be difficult if your clients or the people above you in the company don't understand why it's necessary. And a big part of it is discovering which assets you already have. So not only the work that you've done previously that you could repurpose or you could refresh, but also the people in your company that work well together. The people who are good at you know, promoting video, producing video, um, writing press releases, you might have some people who aren't really recognized for the work that they're doing, some people who aren't focusing in the right areas. So you really need to know where you stand with your internal assets, where you need to outsource before you can move forward with the strategy. Exactly. And that also, also uh, enables you in an agency to uh, schedule the work for these people. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I could say something about somewhere that we will. <laughs> but no. you won't. No. Um, before reaching into... <laughs> take it from there, Jimmy. One of the cool things about the mediums that we work in is there's a, any number of tools inside of our, like, you know, our content toolboxes. Uh, video, audio... Um, you can use SlideShare to put, if, if you want to, you can use SlideShare to put PowerPoint up on, uh, up on a blog post. Um, social media can be, can be part of your content strategy. But what you, what you really got to ask is what are you selling? And to whom are you selling it? Um, I, can, I can see a number of uses of certain types of content for some products that would be absolutely useless on other types of products. Um, I, so I, I spent a year and a half selling uh, bathtubs and showers. That, that was a client I had had a large um, e-commerce site selling bathtubs. You can only go so far with words when you're describing bathtubs. There's like 480 different manufacturers of bathtubs in this world. How many different ways can you describe a bathtub? But a video goes a gajillion miles in a description, especially when you're selling a high-end product. Yeah, that's what a lot of people don't really realize. Uh, videos more about uh, seeing things and that you can't touch usually on the web, and that's how I try and describe it to uh, clients. We're asking people to spend. Uh, in the case of this this client I had, they were asking people to spend um, in the high hundreds, or even into the thousands on one item. That right. was going to be shipped to them. They, you know, and this is an e-com place, so they can't. The, the the customer can't go touch it, can't go see its actual size. They have to relate to it somehow. And again, words and image alone just don't do it. 
especially when you're asking again somebody to put twenty five hundred dollars on their credit card. So yeah. again, you, you you need to use any tool at your at your disposal that's relevant to the audience, and meeting a need the audience has to tell the story of of of, of your clients for your clients. Well, and a lot of that is about education. I wrote about this last year or early this year on Search Engine Watch and just understanding the different learning styles so people who are they learn by reading, people who learn by seeing, people who have to write things out so if you can appeal to the different types of learners what you're really trying to do is educate your customers you want them to understand how they can use your product um, you know the different ways that, you, they, that, that they can use it and so using a variety of mediums allows you to reach out to all those different people Right, and that's uh, where a lot of people don't really uh, spend enough time is trying to really understand who the audience is for a website and how that may differ from product to product. Like, uh, surprisingly, when I was in payday loans, we started looking at that. The people that you would think would be prime candidates weren't actually the best. Uh, the best were women teachers, actually. <laughs> now, now, for the content developers here, do it. Uh, let me ask: as as you're researching it, are you tailoring concepts and, and programs towards, you know, where that content's being not only you know digested but shared? You know, what I mean, or do you have more? Does it does this market tend to have more people on Facebook or Twitter or wherever? I, you know, what what kind of considerations, research wise, are you doing externally as far as where that content's going to end up, YouTube or wherever? Like, what kind of research or what kind of factors are you looking for to decide? Am I going to tailor this content towards a certain crowd or audience? Um, if I could, if I could get that one first, Miranda. For us, there's two phases. Um, one is our initial research, where you know, it's mostly it's it's keyword driven, um, and then you know, demographic driven. We ask the the client our client to describe who their customers are. After that, you make your assumptions, you deploy the content you think is going, or the content types you think are going to resonate best, and then you fall back on analytics. What is working, what isn't working. Um, it's, that's like, this is a good segue into the idea of ABC testing content. Make three versions of content. Try it out over a, over a period of two months, you know, just changing it back and forth um, every couple of days. See what resonates best. So again, there's, a, there's at least two phases to, to, to answer that question, David. You've got to go with um, what your client initially tells you, and then you've got to go with, you know, actual human behavior. So there's no, you know, the, the acid test at the end of the day is deploying things and seeing what they do. <laughs> that's the best. That's the best testing environment around, right? Well, and I you... think and go ahead, go ahead. Or once once you identify those things that are working well, you want to get the most out of everything you're doing. So if you if you've done one piece of original research, um, you can have your charts in your blog post, but you could also make those into a slide share. You can also put them on. Oh my God, I forgot what it's called. Pinterest. <laughs> you can have you know stats that you can tweet out, and they all lead back to this. You can get a lot of content out of one idea. Yep, and the proper images could be pulled out of the slide share and put on Facebook or Google Plus as mm -hmm. well. There's, uh, you know, that's what I think uh, people really also need to look at and have a plan for how they're uh, building their content. Because at certain stages, you can pull out and kind of advertise where you're going with a finished product, build up to it using the actual materials that are going to appear in the finished content. I, I uh, saw I saw Eric nodding away over there. Um, so, yeah, the, the, you know, you're in the media business these days, you know what I mean? So how are you testing against social or what, what kind of data collection are you using? Your, in the chat here you said to see what works, measure, then replicate. So how are you going about that? Well, actually, I mean, so we have a lot of content writers. I mean, a lot of editors, a lot of producers, and they're going to write about whatever they think is the hottest content out there or hottest topic. So it's less about the keyword research from a you know news publishing model because you have to be so reactive. You can't just like say keywords, right? But at the same time, what we do with the social side is um, we test into each of the social communities. So uh, Facebook users behave differently than Twitter users, than Google Plus, than Pinterest, than all those others. And what resonates with them 
are different, right? So like what we see <clears throat> with Google Plus is that it's slightly older audience. So when we're talking about music, things like the Backstreet Boys resonate better than something like Miley Cyrus um, versus you know, you know Facebook or Twitter. There they tend to skew a little bit younger. Uh, and then once we figure out what kind of content works, like so we figure out what kind of like what the the topics they're interested in. Um, then we figure out what kind of format the content should come in. Should it come in like slideshows, videos, lists, uh, long form, short form, uh, featured length, um, and those kind of things. And then once we figure out what that is that works really well, then we actually produce more of that and then push more of that for those particular audiences. But at the same time, like, you know, tailoring content too closely to each one of those social networks is not necessarily... Um, ROI positive because you know it's still only a fraction of your overall traffic. So you need to make sure that the content you produce still has that wide audience base that can be reshared into other networks. Right, because if they see it on Facebook, they may put it on Pinterest as well, uh, right from Facebook, right using the app. So there's uh, you know you got it. I use every channel that I'm using for a client. I put it all down to set the channels. Like, I don't really try and differentiate or, or target content to a channel. They're all just channels to me. I, I Although, don't. For what See, it's worth, for what it's worth, Terry, you know that Eric's content gets a lot more reaction a lot faster than the content me or my team's writing. Um, let's right, face sure. it, we're much more interested in pop culture lists than we are in 437 styles of bathtub. Uh, it's true. Uh, well, when I was at Demand, we also did very similar things as well. Um, but definitely, it, it's true. I mean, a lot of people didn't necessarily want to share the how-tos on uh, from eHow or necessarily. Uh, Livestrong actually did a lot better, where people were into fitness. But um, it was basically trying to find that niche where people would then like want to interact. I mean, we quickly figured out like you know there's certain topics that people are one and done. They're not going to really reshare. So you have to find that particular part of your business that you know people really do want to talk about and reconsume. Oh, I like talking about how to pour a glass of water. It's like one of the big topics uh, for me. No comment. <laughs> Got to make a video. Don't forget the video. Man. <laughs> Anyhow, one of the things that I use because uh, I'm not really a big data guy. I want to go and review things. First thing I do when I'm doing a content audit is I go and look at the competitors. Uh, that's to me, is the best uh, data that I can find. Because if I see every one of the competitors is using a video on their conversion page, I kind of know that video must be working. Mm -hmm. uh, same with, uh, you know, at different stages. What are they writing about? All those things tell you a lot more than a bunch of fucking data. I'm sorry. Uh, and that has, in my opinion, because of tools, uh, SEO stopped doing that kind of review. For me, it used to be, uh, I want to go to that site. If they're getting what looks like a lot of traffic for a calculator of some sort, I want to look at that calculator and figure out a better way to do it. Make it uh, appeal to a broader audience. Eventually, appealing to that broader audience, i.e., the value add, puts me there and that guy's gone. Uh, that's uh, where I think people kind of miss uh, using competitors. Uh, and uh, what do you guys think about that? Uh, start with uh, Miranda. I think that competitive analysis is definitely part of it, but you have to make sure you're not just doing what everyone else is doing because they're doing it. So there are trends that come along, and it might not make a lot of sense, but everybody hops on it. And, I mean, if, if it's working for you, good, but just because everyone else is doing it, I don't think that's a good reason to take on any one digital marketing strategy. Well, your competitor might be doing podcasts, but you can't replicate that because you've got a Terry, and, well, they've got a Terry, and you don't, so... <laughs> That's the other thing that comes down to what can you do that uh, they are doing as well. Like some people just have that advantage because, uh, and you can't really replicate that. And those are the things 
that you should use to differentiate yourself from the other sites. If they can't do it, that's a distinct advantage to you. There's no arguing that competitor analysis is important. Um, I don't. I mean, I I put a lot of stock in what the competitors are doing, but that rarely dictates what I'm going to do. I mean, yes, if I see something as successful, I want to do it as well. Or uh, or a spin off it, or your own take of it, or your own version. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, another thing competitor analysis tells us is stuff that our competitors aren't doing that we can do, um, and that analysis for me is done mostly in the so in the social media. Um, are they are are the competitors engaging with that community in Twitter? Um, are they getting uh, a lot of pins in Pinterest or reposts in Facebook? Um, that come and to me that comes down to engagement, which in and of itself is is content creation. Every tweet you put out, every Facebook post you put, that's also content. Well, and you can learn a lot too from their negative mentions. So you should be yeah. monitoring, you know, what problems do they have that they're not solving for consumers and where is, where is there an opportunity for you to create content around that? Yeah, I would be, I've always been uh, very interested in what salespeople ask. Uh, for instance, when uh, Dave and I were working for a, a company, uh, we found out from their salespeople that they were having uh, trouble getting certain uh, concepts across to SEO, so Dave and I suggested they use video because uh, uh, the spoken word sometimes just doesn't get understood. Uh, the videos would have been a much better way to do it. Uh, so once uh, you've uh, started this audit, right? Uh, I guess what I'm uh, going towards now is when you're choosing content, we talked about, uh, you know, filling needs and, uh, you know, looking at competitors. Uh, I guess now we can go on to what kind of uh, tools you're using to get your, to do your analysis. Uh, for me, one of the most important is Screaming Frog. After that, uh, uh, I don't think there's maybe uh, majestic. Uh, I don't for, even want to hear from Eric. I'll just be jealous as usual. Thanks. <laughs> so, yeah. Don't even ask Eric what tools he has. Yeah, well, <laughs> Eric writes his own. That that would be kind of unfair. Uh, so, I, what do you people use to discover uh, all the content out there and what's on a site? For me, also the good thing about Screaming Frog is you can use that monthly to figure out what a site has added. Uh, they don't often tell you what they've added to the website. So if you can use Screaming Frog, it's got a, in, in the uh, site map uh, output, it includes uh, last modified dates. So you can easily uh, pull that into Excel and, uh, you know, find out what the new contact is and what's old and what's new. Uh, so I use Screaming Frog. Any of you others use that? And um, you know, I use Screaming Frog. And Terry, you and you and I have talked about the, about Screaming Frog, Frog products before. Uh, I, I love them. I think they're great. They're great folks too. You know, another tool you can use. This is might set, this might sound silly and somewhat counterintuitive, and it's way old. Remember Xenu? Uh, yeah. X E N U. Link, sle link, sleuth. link Sleuth. Oh, it's, it's much like Link Sleuth in that it gives you a footprint of an entire website. It's a free download and it takes hours to run for over large sites. But it'll show you everything that's involved in a website. What are, what are there for like social media tools? That, you know, I know there's some rudimentary ones over at uh, Search Metrics and stuff like that, but I don't think they're well featured enough yet, Terry, you know what I mean? But you know, to get some sort of map of, you know, various social activities on pages throughout the site in that almost that format. I don't know if there is anything out there. I it's not my territory, but is there? You know, because search metrics will show how many tweets, how many pluses, how many Facebooks, links, if you Pinterest and all this kind of shit. And you'll see aggregate numbers. But it'd be interesting to drill down and see which posts because then if you're doing competitive analysis or if you've just come into a new client, you can uh, sort of establish that relation of the social graph to the content they have. 
You know what I mean? On an almost on a page level basis. No, I don't know if there is anything. Yeah, Majestic will do that now, Dave, with the wildcard uh, feature that they added yesterday. They actually talked about how you could find the uh, uh, best tweet by someone by using their wildcard. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I'd talk, but uh, apparently Dixon and Mel are too busy to talk to us. So, yeah. anyways, uh, moving right along. Yes, yes. Actually, you go know, ahead, Eric. Go ahead, Eric. I'm recently, so I wouldn't get too. Go ahead, Eric. If if uh, I don't know, I mean, like, I don't know what everybody's like budget is for for tools, but uh, <laughs> uh, about twenty five thousand a month. Okay, <laughs> you know, here we go. But I mean, what we use here actually is we use a combination of both. Uh, well, we actually use definitely Google real time. Kind of gives you some of like the what what's trending, but um, if specifically for content, both Chartbeat and Parsley. If you're not familiar with Parsley, they're kind of like more of the new kid on the block. Block Chartbeat's been around for a while, but both are great for your content team uh, some, to understand what's actually chat, buddy, working. Yeah, links, links in the chat, man. Oh man, it's Parsley.com. <laughs> hey, Eric, Chartbeat is part of uh, Raven as well, isn't it? Chartbeat. I don't know if uh, Raven has integration with Chartbeat, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised. They have a pretty damn good API. Um, but from an uh, editorial perspective, what you can see is not only content that's trending at that moment, which is actually really great for the news organizations, but like Parsley, they have the same thing where like they show you like number of likes, number of um, tweets, and they also show you kind of like links that are being generated as they see refers coming in. Also, they break down all the traffic for you per article, so you can actually see like um, your direct traffic, your referral traffic, where your major refers are, um, you know, your social traffic, your direct traffic. It breaks it all down. Your earned and owned. Um, it breaks it all that stuff down, and also you can start aggregating things by um, whether what or not kind of budgets. What kind of budgets are you? Are we talking with these tools? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what we pay. I'm thinking it's it's a like it's in the grand to grand area. Okay, well, that's not. That's too also bad. we have we have a lot of sites, right? So I was gonna say, well, no, but even if you know, right. and even if I'm running for e-commerce or what other sites, that's still not a lot, and I divide it out over you know, right. a handful so, of campaigns. So. And then also it's cool. You can break it down by authors. So if you have multiple authors, you can see which authors are performing. And then also if you have like if you have freelancers, right? You want to know whether or not you want to bring that freelancer on more full time. It aggregates all that stuff by author and the trends, and also it shows you like evergreen versus like whether or not it's a revitalized article. It, it's a great, great tool. Really, right? Eh? Uh, which and which ones out of the two? That's uh, I would say Parsley is my favorite, but okay. Chartbeat is more of the, the kind of like more of the industry standard. I would say it's just more heavily used by a lot more editorial teams. They're more comfortable with it. Right. Yeah, there was an article recently that uh, was using uh, data that come out of Parsley about new sites. I'm sure you read that, uh, Eric. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's a number of great articles, but um, yeah, you should definitely check out those tools to see if it's right for you. I mean, we use them quite a bit. Miranda, any tools of choice or weapons in your toolbox? Don't give um, the good ones. Don't, don't be dumb like Eric and <laughs> give away the ones that you need. Know. Well, did, Eric talking... just sold out his whole competitive advantage right there. You know? <laughs> when you're talking about social, um, I like to have a look at the influencers in the area. Tracker is a really good tool for that. Um, mm -hmm. Not Andy Beal's Tracker, but it's uh, T-R-A-A-C-K-R. Um, and it'll help you figure out, you know, who, who is sharing the content that's really influential. Um, and a lot of bloggers now, and certainly magazines, are using editorial calendars, and you can actually look it up several months to a year in advance. Um, that can help you plan timely content, so it might have a better chance of getting picked up by those people. If you could say, "I know you'll be covering this next month, and we've done a bit of research into that, and you know, I'd be happy to talk to you about that." So it takes a bit of legwork, but I think those those strategies can definitely pay off big time if you can get a really influential blogger talking about your company. Dabs and Doc, you're actually on the other end where you're actually making the content. We're sitting here talking about writers and stuff as opposed, so we're almost a level above with, with tracking stuff. Like, what, are there tools as a con actual hands-on content developer? You know, I mean, outside both of your abilities to write, are there any other things you're using, like Google Trends or something? Maybe I don't know. Well, we we develop content, but we also do content strategy, and uh, you know, Eric pointed out, you know, I don't have that kind of budget. 
So most of my, what what we'll do with a with a content audit has some overlap with what we would do in a site audit. So you know we'll we'll look out there and see what the content is is available on the on line, whether it be on site or off, and determine where the traffic is in social, and we try to identify the audience above everything. And then from there we can, and of course, obviously, the first step is to identify the message. What, what are we trying to get across for the company? Then we define like, the audience, and then we look at the avenues and the method. Uh, but for for automated tools, you know, I, you know, I have several tools that I do when I do a site audit. I use two or three of those when I'm doing just a content audit to identify and locate first the content, then the uh, users, and uh, and try to bracket them. Dabs. Yeah, I don't. I don't really have that much to add. I mean, we we try to pull all the content that we can. You know, all the assets, regardless of whether it's written content, video, audio, um, initially. And again, you know, try to see if they're actually uh, using uh, uh, the different various, whether it's keywords, whether it's intent, whether it's goals. Uh, so a lot of that, uh, I know Doc and I go through the site manually. Uh, and yeah, we do use some tools. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll even jump on Google Analytics and just pull, you know, just from Google Analytics. Well, you know, I even like Eric's a bit about the real time stuff. It actually, I, right. I find myself looking at it a lot more. Yeah, actually, and again, depending depending on 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 what what the company is. I mean, if it's something like what Eric's doing, then of course you want real time stuff. Uh, but if it's lawyers, engineers, or you know. Uh, flower shops. I mean, there's you know each each niche has a has a has a different approach, but you know you're yeah, still the, the real time has less of a value unless you're running a specific sure. campaign on that day or that week sure. or whatever. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Uh, we actually have a question, folks. First ever SEO Pros Helpline Hangout Q and A. Huh. Um, Steve uh, Steve Bonin. He's been actually in a lot of these lately. Everywhere we go, Terry. Uh, he's asking, uh, how do you research to find out who your audience is? Let's say for a local company budget. All right, Jim, we'll go there for since you were talking about the local stuff earlier, smaller group of people. You know. Okay, for a local com, the way the question's phrased, you ended with um, local company budget. Well, if you um, click on Q and A here on the left, you'd be able to see the question on the right. Oh, I can. Excellent. Yep, yep, yep. Verbatim, and then you can decide what he's. Just a moment. We're just downloading the app to get the yeah. uh, audience no, question. The question doesn't appear there for me. Yeah, it doesn't even. Really? Oh, wow, man. Anyways. Yeah, um, I'm afraid I just downloaded an app for nothing. Oh, there we go. There we go. Um, Say for a local company budget. Well, um, Steve, it really depends on the local company's budget. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. That's, that's the truth. Here's a hard truth. The web is an expensive place to work. Our time, and I'm not, I'm not saying this to, 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 to sound conceited or anything, but our time costs money. So, if it's a local company, if it's a small company, um, how large is its area? What is it selling? Is it for hipsters? Is it for older people? Who are its demographics? Does it have parking? You know, there's a whole bunch of questions you have to ask about the physical location to figure out who its clients are. What does the sales staff say? You go to go to the go to the uh, retail clerk, the person at the cash register, and ask them about their customers. The best way to do, um, I'd say, do research for a local business is talk to the business itself, talk to the employees, talk to people in the shop, find out who they are. Now, it's when you start talking a regional or a national business where you can't actually go and reach out and touch those people, touch those people yourself. Then you have to start doing the real research. Well, and I think for a small company. Um, anyone can do this if they know how and they have the time, but to see where people live on social, you can use the Facebook or LinkedIn Ads Manager and just put in different um, interests, different broad categories, different groups, and see how many people are active on those social networks from from that area. Then you can then you have to figure out how to reach them, and I mean that's going to cost money, but it doesn't cost anything to go in, pretend you're going to create an ad, and have a look at how many people are registered. And you know, Miranda, that's true. That'll give you an idea of uh, a small group of people in in a 
somewhat defined local area. Yeah, just on that network. Like, would it be worth me even considering advertising here? Yes or no? Would you be able yeah. to do that for your neighborhood in uh, your central Ontario city? I can. And it'll say you can go up to 15 kilometers around. It gets pretty small. I've been able to look up um, towns that are 15,000 people, 10,000, 15,000. So quite a few are listed now. Um, Steve, I see that uh, Steve Bonin is actually typing into the uh, question. Does that answer your question? He wants to know the budgets of 1,000 uh, to 1,500. So uh, he originally had 500. I was, I was going to say that's not going to get you much. You'd have to uh, stick to pretty basic campaign, <laughs> I think, for 500 bucks. 1,000, you're getting into where you can produce actually decent. So, yeah, and, and there you go. There's another one, isn't it, guys? Because to me, a half-decent piece of content that, you know what I mean, uh, my team's doing research on the background and the, and the, the demographic. Uh, Doc and Gabs are writing the piece, da-da-da. Then you got promotional efforts. A thousand bucks isn't an unreasonable number for one good piece of content, is it, really? Like, including all the promotional elements and everything outside of that. Like, an evergreen piece of pillar content of some kind, you know? Well, I mean, think about how often it's going to get used and deployed in the future, too, eh? Um, you're not just buying the piece of content for a one-off for a one-off promotion. Exactly. Right, That's it's a piece pretty... of pillar content, that evergreen kind of stuff that over time will, will, will stand up. Yeah. Well, that's why, too, when you uh, tailor it to the uh, buying process, it's always going to get used. It may be a piece of content now, but now it's part of the helping the uh, user make their decision. So uh, it's going to get reused. It's part of and it, and it builds authority and many other signals that, you know, right. if it's Google or anywhere else, proliferate, right? You know, they're all good. I'd rather have two, you know, two $500 pieces of content, including, you know, whatever promotional elements, than I would having 10 or 20 posts, you know, one every day or crap like that. You know, I'd rather have two pieces of stand-up exceptional work than I would 20 of crap. Yeah, I, I'm in the uh, that same field where I think uh, I instead of doing guest blogging, I'd rather be a contributor on four sites and give each site one piece every week, and uh, you know, screw the guest blogging. Like, why spend all that time uh, looking to get on sites that when you look at their homepage, they're probably an accident looking to happen. When you look at guest bloggers' uh, sites, to vary the topics, except for, for instance, Dave, we at uh, SNC, you and I look for contributors, not guest posters, right? We didn't want a guy who's going to come in and do one or two posts. We wanted contributors. We wanted people who are, we're going to, we don't, we can count on them every, every, you know, when they're scheduled. Now, for to note that Terry, um, that's not, that's that's hard to do if you're talking about like uh, volunteer-generated content. Um, finding people who will write for free is getting harder and harder and harder. Oh, isn't it just people who will write quality for free is getting harder and, and, and that's it. You know, I can find lots of people to write for free, but that content's not doing anything. It's it's you know not the kind you know there'd be certain people on SNC that when they wrote. Bang, you know, but that they were in small demand. You know, there wasn't many of us. There was more of just a uh, every day, and and that's important. You just and and then you're building brand, and then your you know perceptions of your brand. Uh, you know, as some of the other news rags in our industry have suffered. And, yeah, it's 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 those people too. Um, Scott Derrick's asking, what do we mean when I said promotional elements? Meaning that when you're planning a content strategy or planning any piece of content, it's not living in a void. It's, you know, the old tree falls in a forest. So if it's your PR teams reaching out to their contacts, if it's the social teams doing their thing, once that, even once that content's deployed, there are still elements and costs that people might not understand. So again, if, if I'm talking a $500 piece, if, if, you know, whatever your social media costs are in support of elements to that, you got to include that in the cost of the program or the strategy because it does it's not for free. So. Yeah, it doesn't so promote it's, itself. Someone's actually got to get on. Unless you're show. Eric and you got to say to me. And here's <laughs> the thing, uh, you're further ahead to do it that way too because uh, 
you know, my true belief is that uh, social is not a ranking factor. It's a ranking signal. And if you won't put your content down your social channels, Google just says it's so crappy. They won't put it down their social channels. So that's why uh, it looks like it's correlated to ranking. And, you know, beyond ranking, social moves people. Social moves eyeballs. Um, I, I bet you half the media intake I have now is because of because I saw it in social. And it builds yeah, brand. That's it where builds brand I've lift, you know? A lot of my news now is from Google Plus and uh, occasionally Twitter. Steve, Steve Bonin just asked a really interesting question. Um, when you create content, do you do so as yourself? As an, <laughs> as an employee, or do you write it as a marketing team, or even as the business owner? Depends. Depends on how I'm getting paid, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> really, I can write in voice. <laughs> I've sometimes written as up to eight or ten people a day. It's exhausting. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not entirely sure where Steve's going, hopefully you can clarify a bit, but are you talking about personas, maybe? Um, meaning who on the company's site is responsible for that piece of content? And where Obviously, is the content deployed? Like, is this in social media or on a static page? I think but, he's kind of asking what kind of persona do you yeah. take? You Meaning, take here's the issue, guys. Like the it, you hire someone to develop content, or, let's say, writing on your blog in this instance, and they're writing on that blog, and so now they have you kind of over the barrel if they become this, this personality that, you know, this could become an issue. Whereas you... Nice day, froze. Does this mean we can get our Bruce Clay jokes in? Like, you know, like Lisa Barone had Bruce Clay over a barrel? Is, is, is that what he was getting at? Oh, come on. Yeah. One, so, one, one. Oh, is he there? I think he was talking about the risk of developing personalities within your company and are you screwed if they leave? And I mean, that's it. Forrester has written about this a lot. You know, is it... Is it too much of a risk? Well, what's the benefit you get from doing that? If you have people in your organization that your customers really relate to, maybe it's worth it for you. Um, you have to protect yourself and make sure that the intellectual property rights are clear. But I, I think if, if you have someone in your company that you think might screw you when they leave, they probably shouldn't be there in the first place. Okay. So if you have a good relationship, a working relationship, it should be okay. Yeah. Usually the benefits outweigh the risk. Um, Steve, when we're writing web content for, like, you know, say we're describing a product, it's very dry writing. I don't think that you could say that we're writing as an employee, as ourselves, or as a business owner. We're, just, we're using descriptive words to try to market a physical object. If uh, one, of our, one of our old clients is a sort of a, a, a mummy blog, a mother's blog, Often we, when we wrote promotional material for it, we tried to write in the voice of the owner, uh, a minor celebrity in Canada. So we tried to write in her voice because it was supposed to be coming from her. So I, I think the answer to your question is really context-driven. You know, what is the content representing and in what venue? I think you have to be pretty careful with personas like you know, if you get, and this is one of the things, right, that for me, authorship being a ranking factor does not make sense. And the reason being is it's people involved. Someone is going to get paid for their name, and Google will not like that. So that's my thing with author rank is that's just bloggers hoping to make a name, out, make money off of their name. Uh, that's why they... And by the way, Terry, power to them. If a blogger can make money off their writing, power to them. Someone's making money off it. Yeah, yeah. it took us way too long to get there. Don't knock us for making money. <laughs> yeah. wow. No, but then go, don't go write your own book and write your own fucking blog. I, I still, you know, this is you know, it's well, still a consideration anytime you think about it. So. If I'm a businessman, I don't want you coming to me and negotiating your salary. Because I can't let you go, uh, you know I mean, that's not a good extent, situation. Though, like, when I look at like authors that we have, right? Uh, 
if you know one if we can't retain them that's bad on us or bad on our own company right but we can't retain them but if our authors go off and write at the New York Times and we have their content on our site that basically means we have a New York Times writer who's mm-hmm. written their stuff right so if you look at the world of real authorship it's that quality of content migrates with them but also it, where it lives also retains the quality of where that author goes, right? So if they are really a great author and you don't have the ability to retain them either by the content interest that you're producing or by monetary values, it's not like it's a loss, right? Because they're right, going to right. I don't write, I don't write for right? search engine landing anymore, but if Google considers me to be an expert, my bio is there, my articles are there, my name is associated with that place even though I'm not there. Exactly. And the other thing, I mean, like, when I'm thinking about personas, like, the thing that we, we actually use a couple personas here, but not less, it's less because the content that we're writing uh, is either risque or um, something that can be, I don't know, pol- extremely polarizing in some cases. And, you know, either it, it's something that the writers actually have fun actually jumping into that persona and writing as that person. So it's less about, hey, ghostwrite as this person because I need you to like just pretend to be Do you guys have person. like guidelines of the persona and, and like a backstory or any kind of history when they jump in or do the writers already know the persona? They how do you keep how do you keep them, how how do you keep the voice changing too much? You know? They pretty much know the persona, right? And like I mean it's not hard I mean it it takes a skilled person to be able to jump into the mindset of that persona, but like people who do it frequently enough like it's not necessarily hard to context switch into that that voice you know like I mean if for very good writers they they're able to easily do that and, uh, and if you make it fun for them where it's like hey you can like if you choose to you can have this outlet just like you know BS SEO right like where basically you have that outlet to basically be something else and like you know voice off on something yeah, but there's people out there in our industry, especially, they'd still be nobodies if they didn't work at that and write on certain sites. Sorry. No, I mean it, it's yeah, definitely well, like a totally I mean, different direction, though, man. If, if you look at <laughs> that, doesn't like, want yeah. me to go there. He's, but that's a different know, hangout altogether. It goes man. like this when I start to talk. Oh, I know yeah. I might be venturing gotta, into a. Whoa, boy! Whoa, 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 whoa! Hold up! Hold up! Forget our, what are we involved with? Oh my god. Forget our own industry, right? But like if you look at something like, you know, you guys were talking about like volunteer contributor, like what we call it is contributor model. And when you look at the Huffington Post, they don't pay those people a lot of money to be on the Huffington Post. They've built a platform and a reputation, just like, you know, people in the SEO community here. But like they've built up a reputation where you can build a community. You don't necessarily need to stay there forever. But at the same time, the the site gets something out of it, and the writer gets something out of it, just right. like Search Engine Land and all those well, other for places. For sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I write there for free, and there's a reason, you know. Uh, I would never tell a uh, someone from a, a site to go uh, to a forum. Oh, sorry. Um, Steve's next question was, do you use industry forums? Um, do you ask company experts to answer questions and just rewrite it? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, no. Absolutely not. I think, okay, I'm going to take a stab at this one. Since since actually, um, it turns out Steve lives about 40 minutes from, oh no, he's on the other side of Toronto there, Terry, actually he's closer to you. Um, but I, what I think he's saying is, is by using the three forums, what he's saying as as content um, idea sources, meaning he's asking, do you guys, does anyone or have has anyone ever, and I know I have for when I started writing about SEO and stuff, do you take questions people have in, in a forum and then rewrite that into a, a, a strong piece of content that answers the question? I think that's what he's driving at. Do you use it as seed ideas for content? He's not saying to go and post on forums. Okay? Oh, for as a seed idea? Well, that's fair. Right. Sure. I think yeah, that's what he seems to be saying yeah. here. If you're looking for ideas in the morning, like what where you get your inspiration, as long as it's your words and your explanation and you're not fobbing off someone else's writing as your own, you know... <laughs> Nothing wrong with that either. Yeah, I mean, inspiration yeah, comes. The Hell. United States writes his own speeches. I don't think so. 
Well, no, but again, we're not we're not talking about them. We're talking about us as content creators. Um, <laughs> and there's a there's a certain honor to not plagiarizing. <laughs> you oh, know? Well, plagiarism that's different than. Um, I mean, as, as Steve wrote the question, um, you know, it's it's a. I'm just answering as I'm seeing the the question was written. Yeah. And Google thought decided I didn't need to see the question anymore. So thanks. And there, Jim. I, I think that I think that taking somebody else's thoughts and repurposing them as your own is pretty close to plagiarism when you're a thought leader yourself. Oh, uh, I would if I was doing something like that. Almost always link back to the farm so that I don't get the shit on. Yeah, I'll, I'll always credit people with their ideas. It's only fair. You might ha we, we might have some of our own ourselves one day and want the same treatment. Now it's pretty easy to claim that that's not really how we feel. So always have the case for deniability in there. Yeah, but again, Steve, if you can find inspiration where other people are asking questions, heck, go for it. Well, that's what most writing is, is looking for inspiration to write about this stuff, I mean. Well, why would you write about it unless you want, uh, at least in our industry, unless you wanted to help answer some question that you yourself or somebody else might have had, right? Like, or why else address the topic? To correct some stupid thing that someone said in another post. Well, sometimes, too, you may see something that, that you see can use some expansion. So you mm -hmm. simply say, I see John Smith commented on such and such forum, and you know, I'd like to add to that, or I'd like to counter that with this argument. And, and you can add some more value to it and possibly get some mileage out of uh, any attraction that piece already had. But again, you're giving credit and you're adding value. Yep. Yep. I think with content, it all comes down to uh, you can do anything that everyone else has done. You won't really get much out of it unless you add value that no one else did. Right. Otherwise, you're just regurgitating. You know. And I do want to add. I do want to add one more point. If you are going to go to the forums and uh, try to re and write on what you read there, learn to spell two words: causation. And coincidence and correlation. That's it. Causation and correlation. If you can spell those two words, you'll be fine. Yeah, I'd use experts in a forum for sure. I try and get those experts to be leading guides on the forum too, and then advertise like hell all over the place. Thing, for sure, because that's what a lot of the web uh, and content of, is about: is demonstrating. Uh, your abilities, or what your product can do, or your personal abilities. That's uh, why we started as SEOs and, and web designers, building websites so that we could showcase our stuff. And that's what well, websites should be. It should be showing your ability. Well, your you're going across the thing into branding, too. Yeah. Well, I, I know everyone has to get going, and I'm sure, as always, we can sit here and talk about this stuff all day long. Um, so, so if we, where, how do we wrap it up? What's a good way to wrap, Terry? Uh, um, on, give it, give it in, in however many sentences you need, Miranda and, and Eric and Jim. Um, you, just some sage wisdom of content strategy. Anything you want, any kind of wisdom, any platform, any direction. Just, just give us one sound bite before you go. I think that, especially in local markets, people shouldn't be too intimidated because there is still a lot of crap content going on. Um, it's completely the opposite when you get into bigger brands and global brands, um, national brands. They're hiring journalists. I mean, you really have to be top of your game now to stand out. Mm -hmm. But for the local people, when you hear us talking about that stuff, you know, hiring journalists, you don't have to do that if you have a bakery in Toronto, for example. Um, just get started. Start blogging. Commit to doing it once a week as a start, once every two weeks. Um, do something regular and hold yourself to it. That's good. Have a plan and work like on the plan. Jim? Yeah. Um, I'm going to riff off something Vanessa Fox wrote the other day. She wrote that she was sick of hearing people say content is king because it's not. Mm -hmm. Using content properly makes it a very powerful tool. Content is, is meant to describe and to move. You describe the product and you move people towards making the, making the 
either purchase decision or on-page action that you, you, you want them to take. Um, pl uh, content is a tool. It's a hell of a tool. Um, and it comes in all sorts of forms. Use what's best for, you know, that specific application. Yep. And Eric? Oh, well, uh, I'm kind of more on the analytics side of things. So uh, I've definitely come in places where uh, content is a little bit more of a squishy thing where people just generate ideas and they think this is a great thing that we should be doing. Um, I, I think that businesses that are going to succeed with whatever your content strategy is going to be is you need to be able to measure it. So definitely make sure that you put in place the you know the the metrics in place so that you can actually monitor and evaluate whether or not your content is actually going to be performing well over the long term and then see if you can replicate that. Um, ultimately that's going to help you continue to grow your content strategy because if you can build a, a business case around it you know exactly what's going to be working for you in the future. And, and Doc, um, last but never least, uh, beyond the fact that well-written, grammatically structured content is a ranking factor, uh, what's what's your uh, your your one bit, pearl of wisdom for the afternoon? Well, I, first of all, I disagree a little bit with Jim that uh, content is only to drive and move. Everybody out there is not trying to sell a product or a service. Some people are simply trying to brand. Some people are simply trying to exercise their desire to, to share, and. Uh, Eventually, some of those people may decide to monetize a blog. They may start to try, try to make some money off of it. But the content does more than simply push people through the conversion funnel. You know, a lot of times it's pillar content for the for the individual. Uh, I think it's very important to look and see what your content is supposed to accomplish. You know, what is the message? And that's what I see so many clients missing. They're assuming. They know their customer. They're assuming they know their message, and they're wrong on both counts a lot of times. Yeah, I'd say just uh, for me, it's just do it, and uh, you know, the, do what you can afford. I'm and sorry, but that's been trademarked, so um, you're gonna have to come up with something. Just do it. Yeah. Uh, I think Nike might like have a bit of a problem here. So. Oh, okay. But you know what I say, okay? Uh, Basically, I think content should be an ongoing thing, and you should plan on having to always do it, because it's pretty clear that if you stop producing content, Google forgets about you pretty quick. All right. Well, Miranda's got to run. Thank you ever so much for dropping Thank in. Thank you, guys. Miranda. Thanks very much. Awesome yeah, you, Miranda, uh, always great. Huh? We'll talk soon. Yeah. And Jim, you got a meeting, do you, sir? Yeah, I got a meeting in about 10 minutes. So, folks, thank you so much. It was fun hanging out. Yeah, catch you later. Later, Jim. Be well, y'all. And with that, uh, I don't know. I guess we'll call it a day, Dave. Unless you guys want to keep talking, I don't mind. And strangely enough, well, I'm going to end the broadcast. There's two other, you still got five viewers who might give a fuck. And you've probably got people on the website and stuff like that. Okay. Well, Hannah says hi. Good. Hello, Hannah. Good Let's to meet you. Hi, out. Hannah. There's no questions left. I don't. Ah, uh, yeah. Steve. Steve's got. When he's thinking about working for a technical company, where there are experts within the company working for. Yeah, experts uh, always are handy to have in any client's uh, repertoire. You can bring them to the surface, get them writing, get them express. You know, get it up the chain. How important that is in today's society and. I think to a degree, Terry, what, you're feeding their egos anyways. A lot of people want to put their face out there. They just need a little shove in the right direction, you know. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I would want to uh, have them people very, uh, on the right uh, forums, I would want them very, uh, to, to be in the spotlight on those forums. In other words, the influencers. On well, think, of, think of these hangouts as content, you know what I mean? I've been on some where there's, dead space and humming and hawing or low-keyed chatter and, and some of the personalities, all the love to their intelligence probably shouldn't be in video formats of content like this because they're just not engaging or passionate or whatever, you know what I mean? That's why everyone loves you, Terry. It's like, oh, I did love... You know how many times I get tw things on... I was going to say tweets on Skype. Ugh. You know how many times I got messages on fucking Skype that are like, 
I love Terry, man. He's awesome. I can listen to him all day and shit like that, man. Why? Because you're passionate. Who, you know, they agree with you or disagree. You know, and people love to disagree with you, and, and I think that's important too, Doc. No, like you know that that whole element uh, of having personalities that are facing forward, public facing people for the company, engaging depending on on the situation. You know, obviously the dojo, we're, we're adversarial a bit in the dojo, so that's our style. So that almost comes through when you see this content. You know, our style works. Gotta be like me, you know, able to take it. The good with the bad. I don't put it stock in either one. But yeah, Fox you've got good. Maybe the ones that are really personal. Steve, if you've got good technical writers and people that that you know are good at writing white papers and use that as content. If you got people who are good in front of a cam camera, use that as content. You know, leverage the people in the business and and their passion and what they're good at. You know, but avoid what they're bad at for sure. Yeah, yeah the guy can't really take the heat. Uh, when someone disagrees with him, he's probably not the guy you want out front. For he's not going to put the image out that you want to project. Yeah. That's right. Uh, uh, you know, Sh uh, Sharif Ahmad has left us a question or something possibly, but it's in Cyrillic. Or no, it's in Arabic, Arabic. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Arabic. So Where's sorry, Aaron's, Aaron's not here at the moment. Sorry. Yeah. I think the, uh, the Brazil, they've taken the internet down. It's you know, dog, dog from your side of things. You know what I mean. You know, I, I, I get happy with with pandas, pan, pandas and penguins and stuff because two, twofold. One, I get work from it, and two, I just like to see things getting cleaned up. I know in you guys' business, in your business, you guys, eesh, I'm starting to get New York thing going on. Um, in from your perspective, has it improved things? Are you getting? Because I remember like three years ago how horrible it was, people wanting $10 articles and crap like that. Have you seen an uptick in people wanting better stuff and paying and, and obviously paying for it? Or? No, since, since Panda hit, absolutely, uh, you know, there's been more cognizance of, of the necessity to, to put up some quality content, and that continues to improve, you know, and it, it is slowly but surely soaking in on people that you can't put crap content up and expect to get uh, lasting results. So that that has helped our our content strategy business grow tremendously, to the point where we recently took on uh, Laura. Laura Crest has come on to manage top shelf copy for us because it was just taking it was growing so fast and taking too much time. And on the Penguin side, you know, the uh, my SEO business has grown tremendously because we do so much forensic and recovery work. So I haven't had time to put into the content. So yeah, I mean, I love watching Google Google uh, dial this stuff in and, and get better at it because it's helping me in, in all regards in terms of business. Yeah, I think though too, uh, Doc uh, cuts a lot of the uh, low end low end people. Oh, no, absolutely. I think they're still. I think they're still oh. getting used. I think there's still crap and idiots out there still yeah, yeah, used. But, but it's getting tougher for them. Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah, I would imagine. Odesk for the win once you know, There's time. still lots of SEO companies that uh, are advocating using article marketing and, well, and you know, all of that uh, low-end stuff. It's not like because Google said we're not going to count it anymore or, or they're put panned on it. it you know, companies are going to sell what they have to sell. Well, we saw somebody this morning saying that they're paying three dollars per article, and you know, and I almost gagged. But, geez, it's got to be some killer content, right? But the bottom line is, there are people out there. There's spam networks and blog networks that are paying two and three dollars for articles because they're a churn and burn. Put it up, use it, abuse it, burn it down, put up a new one. Uh, you know, there there is still there's still business out there for those people, but it's getting tougher. And that churn and burn is a much shorter cycle now. You might be able to put up a crap site a couple of years ago that would last you six months. Now, if it lasts you six weeks, you've made a record. Okay, so you know it's getting tougher. And and, and from my standpoint, since we don't walk on that side of the line, we we use you know we build quality sites, we do quality SEO, we use quality content. So for me, it's a godsend. You know that new sheriff in town is is making business wonderful for us. If I was walking on the dark side, I would probably be cussing up a storm. Yeah, well, you also don't sell packages. You know. 
a lot of these guys uh, or a lot of companies are still selling packages. Yeah, uh, I know. Where, a lot of these big companies are, yeah. Well, all kinds of companies are doing it. It's just, I don't know, you know. Uh, you know <laughs> well, it's like, uh, you know, having one size fits all. You know what I mean? I, I think mean, you I could, should have an a la carte menu and work from that. Absolutely. No, I think, you know, a package in terms of, let's say, you know, from a content generator standpoint, we're going to give you three blog posts a week or five blog posts a week. That's an acceptable package. That's a, a quantity of, of articles or posts. Okay, fine. But when you start trying to, to package SEO, that's just asinine. That's like, that's like walking into a doctor's office. No exam, no diagnosis. It's going to cost you 60 bucks. I'm going to give you three shots and hand you four pills. Don't expect a lot of results, you know? Yeah, that's for sure. Well, you, you can expect results. Just don't expect good results. <laughs> I had to get to uh, clean my thing. throat out. So. Uh, I'm SEO pros. Look at me go. But Doc is not only a good, uh, an excellent copywriter. He's also an excellent public speaker. Well, as long as they don't mind the occasional f bomb. That I think you're in the wrong industry. <laughs> or yeah, later on, politics. <laughs> See. I used to be a perfect gentleman when speaking, and, and, and I got hanging around Terry, and I just realized, you know what? I just realized, I look in the mirror one day, I said, I'm 60 years old, I don't need to give a fuck. <laughs> That's what it is, you become so old, you don't care anymore. I don't care anymore what people think of me, you know? I've given up on that one a long time ago. Well, to our six viewers, we just dropped a link on the uh, SEO Pro's Google Plus page. If you'd like to come in and join us, feel free. Oh, Dave's partaking. Oh, look at me go, baby. I'm like a professional. Seven of these motherfuckers last week, and Doc still calls me a pussy. <laughs> fucking crazy, man. You. I, I'm like, you know, I, you know, I, I'm the master. Uh, no, you're not I, I'm like the, I'm like the one, jack of all uh, trades, master of none. You know, I start talking data. Fucking Eric makes me look like an idiot. I start talking hangouts. You know, I got you. I'm trolled <laughs> everywhere I go lately, man. Hey, you're just yeah, so troll. Always a bridesmaid. <laughs> Trollable. How do you like my new logo, David? Dad? No bullshit. I like it. Look, yeah. That looks vaguely familiar. I, I think too. I've seen that before. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I thought that was a picture, John. Hold on. No, no. That no, is that'd a, be a horse's ass, not a, not a bull. <laughs> <sorry. laughs> horse bull. Oh. oh God! So, oh, when you're doing content, doc, like, how do you? I'm curious how you price things, how you structure stuff. Meaning, like, a lot of times, if I was dealing with content people, I'd supply the research, supply a lot of the background and elements of that, so they can focus on the writing. So, do you do you have like tiered structures? Meaning, like, I know the infographic guys are like that. Do we have to do the research, or did you? Are you supplying the research kind of thing? Right. Um, you know, do you, do you actually tier pricing that way as far as how much research time has to go into putting a piece together or whatever? It, it varies a little bit, obviously, from client to client, but uh, typically we'll look at, first of all, you know, when somebody tells me uh, I've got five keywords I want to go after, I want 500 to 600 words, and I need uh, three posts a week, I generally try to walk away from those things. You know, I, I to me... When somebody no, if, I comes, do, like, if I come to you and I say I want a piece of pillar content, I'm willing to spend 500 bucks or something like that. You know what I mean? I'm well, looking for something evergreen, something seriously worked out, researched, one of the best documents on the web on that topic matter. You know, if I come to you with something like that, how, how are you going about the pricing? And if, do, if, if you toss and does me a level couple, of research I provide ahead of time towards that project come into play in, in, in the, what you have to do? To, to really put together a, a solid piece of, of kick-ass content, I have to be able to feel a little bit passionate about it, too. So if you come to me and you say you want a, a, a nice piece of content that's, gonna, that's going to uh, talk up the concept of keyword density, okay, I'm going to tell you to go fuck yourself. 
because I can't write about that shit. I don't believe in it. I think it's wrong. I won't put it out there. I don't care what the price is. But my preference is that you give me a couple links. You know, here's here's a couple of resources. This is the kind of the, the kind of direction I think this t t piece needs to go in. Don't give me a length. You know, I'll tell you, I'll do it for 200 bucks, 500 bucks, whatever it is, and it's going to be research. It's going to present the theme adequately. That may come in at 800 words. It may come in at 3,000 words. I don't care. Whatever it takes to get the, the message across properly is what you're going to get for the price I quote you. And, and the price I quote is going to vary quite a bit, depending upon how much research I have to do. Uh, if, if it's going to need some special stuff, if I got to do a bunch of screenshots and and uh, some some power shop, or excuse me, Photoshop work, you now there's going to be a little bit of an added charge to that. If it's just a matter of researching the topic and putting together a, a pillar piece, that's pretty much going to be a standard price. You know, if it, uh, if it's a, a sales page, you know, one of these endless scroll sales pages, it's going to run about two grand. You know, if it's a if it's a uh, piece of web copy for for your homepage, it's probably going to run about two hundred. You know, because my research basically for the home page is going to be on site. I'm going to research the company and your message, and that's what I'm going to do. But if it's going to be a sales page, now there's going to be a lot of work going into it. There's going to be a lot of graphics going into it. You know, that's, that's going to take some time. So part of it that factors in for us is, is the hours we're going to have to put into it. Part of it is the, uh, the backup graphics and that sort of thing we're going to have to put into it. It, it just you know, it varies. Again, there's no real package even for content. You know, when somebody wants a blogging uh, service where we're going we're gonna to handle their blog for them, total blog management, we're going to put up three posts per week, we're going to handle all the comments, we're going to take care of graphics and everything for the post, bam, I can give you a package for that. But it's still going to vary somewhat by one client or another, you know. Am I having to in invent and develop a persona over time? Is there one existing I'm taking over? Is the voice difficult, or is it a, a easily made engageable voice? That's the, the sort of things that come into play, and that's going to affect somewhat the pricing. What Dave leave? Uh, he dropped out. Yeah, and he's... maybe his machine blew up again. Uh, could be. Yeah, I don't think the uh, low-end content has got a lot of uh, places now. Oh, now he's back. Well, he was back for a second. Well, it's unfortunately, it still has a life, but I think it is dwindling. I hope it's dwindling. <laughs> I think it's a cool idea, Doc. A cool idea, Doc. We were talking yesterday about topicality and keywords, and I was thinking that it would be a, a nice idea to have like series, um, let's say five articles. But those five articles, they're gonna be one article split it down to five, and then you load it up on 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 WordPress, for example, if it's a blog. And you put that seri with you um, attribute that seri with uh, link prefs and next, and you don't need to have on all the all the pages the keyword. Well, when we do something like that, we're doing that uh, from the SEO arm. You know, the you know developing content is one thing, and and putting it to maximum use, I look at that more as an SEO function. Uh, sure. You get beyond content strategy. Now you talk about presentation and semantic markup and shit like that. Uh, I don't do that out of top shelf. I do that out of intrinsic value because it's just not, it's too specialized for for just content generation. Okay. Well, I have nine minutes. Two. I gotta go help Deb and Scott or something. Okay, well, this is a question. You want to ask David about the site, I think, right? Yeah, fuck yeah, for sure. <laughs> <coughs> well, you gotta be using that. If you're not, you don't know how to write content, obviously, if you're not doing some LSI. And thank God Eric's not here, so. That's all I can say. Still on air, yeah, we are apparently. 
Yeah, I'm going to turn it off here soon. I think we've exhausted this. Might as well. I think we kind of shot the wad. Yeah.